Um, I'm going to be preaching from Romans chapter 15, verses 7 through 13. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there, and it's going to show up here, I think, uh, on the screens. And uh, we'll get there in just a few minutes. You know, we're down to the last two months of this year. You know, some 60, 61 days, and 2020 will be a memory. You know, thank God. <laughs> Now we don't, nobody knows what 2021 is going to bring, uh, you know, uh, but this year, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll be happy when 2020 is in the books and, uh, and behind us. Looking forward, hopefully, to a better year in 2021 with a little bit, a little bit of uh, trepidation, maybe a little bit of concern, because who knew uh, at the start of 2020 how things were going to go for this year. You know, we started out celebrating a brand new year, 2020, clear vision, you know, that kind of thing. And boy, things have gotten very clear, haven't they? And things have gotten a little murky also. And then, you know, COVID-19 surprised us all. You know, we heard, first of all, well, it's not, not going to be a big deal. Don't worry about it. Go about your business. And all of a sudden, yes, it is going to be a big deal. You know, wear your mask, wash your hands, social distance, and all of that. And uh, as chaplain at Beaufort Memorial, I, you know, we've seen a small uptick in COVID-19 cases. Yes, unfortunately, very small. Hopefully, it won't get any worse. Uh, but we kind of expected that surge. And I don't know if you've read in the paper or not, but Beaufort County now is has gone from being a county of low risk to be a county of medium risk. So please, as speaking as uh, someone who works in healthcare and and is in the hospital on a daily basis, keep wearing your masks, please. Keep washing your hands, keep doing everything you can. I know it's inconvenient. I know it's hard and I know, you know, you may be sitting out there you know, wanting to rip that thing off your face. I get it. I really do. But please keep doing that, and and please keep keep it in mind because uh, we don't want to see any more of a surge than we're seeing. And some places in our nation, unfortunately, are seeing an even greater surge, and are in, uh, and we want to try to control that. And then we saw we saw all of that, and we're still dealing with that. And then we saw the riots and and came to a realization that something definitely needed to change in our nation between races and, and identifying underlying issues that have been ignored or, or haven't been dealt with fully over the years. And we saw all of that and there's still repercussions of that going on as well. And, and then a contentious election season. I'm so glad we took time to pray for this election. And honestly, I, I don't, it's not my concern who you're voting for or who you're in support of, because my concern is that you understand that the kingdom of God does not change. Whoever is in the White House, whichever party is in control of the Congress, the kingdom of God does not change. And all of us who belong to the kingdom of God, because of our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, that relationship with God does not change with the changing politics and the changing e economics and all of that. And in fact, it becomes more of a motivator for us to live our lives in, a, in, in as devoted and dedicated way as possible to Jesus Christ and the Word of God when things seem to be collapsing and things seem to be so difficult and so challenging. That is more of a motivation to be salt and light. And, and so, you know, we're in all of these things and sometimes it gets hard it gets very hard to have the hope that we need for these times. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Abounding in hope by the Word and the Spirit. Abounding in hope 
by the Word and the Spirit because the Word of God doesn't change. The Holy Spirit doesn't change. And therefore, our hope does not need to be diminished. We go through those times. We definitely go through those times. We go through those seasons of, of stress and seasons where we're, we don't know sometimes if, if, like the song says, God, we, we feel like, God, you don't even know my name. And that's because we're human. And God understands that. He created us. He created you. He created me. And He created us with all of these emotions. He understands that when we, when we go through those times. And He doesn't turn away from us. He doesn't, he, he doesn't draw back from us and, and, and say, well, you know, I've done all this for you. And that's, he, never, he never acts that way. He loves you. He loves me. He loves all of us. And even though it feels like within us that, that God has forgotten us, He hasn't. We're on His mind continually and constantly. Even when we feel like we don't know where He is, He's right there beside us. So abounding in hope by the Word and the Spirit. If you have a Bible, take it. If you have your Bible on your device, get there. Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 17. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. I'm going to talk about all of this. And in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy, as it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentile, with His people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. Now here's the verse we're going to focus on. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. May God bless the reading of His Word today. Now the book of Romans, wonderful, wonderful book with, a, with just simply stunning, astonishing statements about the relationship of God with his people and that high point in Romans 8 where, where Paul assures us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And then Romans 12, that, that full chapter when he says, okay, I said all of these things in the first 11 chapters in Romans 12, so I'm urging you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God and your reasonable service of worship and don't be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will know what is, what the will of God is. And then he begins to kind of the, the, draw the book to a close, takes him three more chapters to do that. He comes down to these verses in chapter 15, chapter 15, there's in one more chapter. And this book was written probably while Paul was in Corinth at the end of his third missionary journey. About, and, and he's about to go from there to back to Jerusalem. He'd taken up an offering because back in Jerusalem and Judea, his Christian, Christian brothers and sisters were suffering under a famine, and so he, he had collected some money. And you can read in some of the other letters about the collection. And so he's gotten this together, and it, but he, wants, he knows he wants to go to Rome, but he has no idea that he, how he's going to get there at this point. We know the rest of the story. We can read it in Acts. And so he writes this letter to the Romans. He's in Corinth, about to go back to Jerusalem, anticipating to go to Rome to visit with Christians there. 
and to further the spread of the gospel. And I'm sure Paul, Paul is thinking, you know, God's going to provide some way to get from there to Rome. Maybe a nice cruise ship would be good. Well, it's a ship, but it's not a cruise ship. It's a prison ship, basically, and they're shipwreck. And they spend some time on an island together and, and eventually get back to Rome. Paul's a prisoner the whole time. He doesn't know any of that when he writes this book, this letter to the Romans. And, and so he's, he's anticipating, and he knows that God is a God of hope. And he knows that he can abound in hope through the Word and the Spirit. And he wants to set the stage for when he gets there. And he writes this wonderful, beautiful letter to the Romans. And, and he comes down to this section. And meanwhile, the Roman government is still oppressive. Nowhere in Paul's writings do you ever find him complaining about the Roman government. Nowhere. He, he, he's a Roman citizen, but he's also a Jew at the same time. But you don't ever find him complaining in any of his writings about the Roman government, how bad things are. Even when he's a prisoner, you, you don't find him complaining about how bad it is to be a prisoner. In fact, you find Paul saying, I know how to be content whatever state I'm in. Because he understood that the kingdom of God doesn't change doesn't change with the changing po political tides and the, the changing seasons and the, and the changing economies and all of that. The kingdom of God is always the same. And he learned how to trust in the kingdom of God and God's provision for his needs that God provided every step of the way. And so the, so the Roman government's still oppressive, trying to keep the peace throughout the Roman Empire. Things are starting to shake up, if you know your history. And the Jewish religion centered in Jerusalem around the temple. That's where the focus is for the Jewish religion. They're still trying to survive by collaborating with the Romans up to a point. You know, they'll, they work with them to, because they know if they express any kind of rebellion against Rome, the Rome, Romans are going to come down hard on them, as they did in 70 A.D. Came down and wiped Jerusalem off the map, basically destroyed the temple, and it's never been rebuilt since that time. And so they're still trying to kind of keep things, uh, their national identity as Jews intact by kind of getting along. And so now Christianity is on the rise after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, the establishment of the church, the ascending out of the apostles and Paul and Barnabas and Silas on those missionary journeys, planting churches wherever the Spirit led. And that's kind of what's going on during this whole time period. I want you to understand that, you know, times change. And there are struggles our struggles measure up to their struggles. Their struggles were their struggles, and our struggles are our struggles. But in all of this, in all of this, there is the hope that we can abound in by the Word and the Spirit. Sometimes in the challenges of this year, I've, I've had a hard time talking to God. Especially when I've had to be in the ICU with those, with some of those COVID-19 patients who are coming to the end of their life and they're alone because their families can't be there. And I've had to watch as families have said goodbye through, through a, a FaceTime. And they've tried their best to sense what's going on and it's hard. And I wonder, Lord, why? Why does it have to be this way? These are your people. These are faithful people. People who trust you. People who believe in you. And sometimes, sometimes, frankly, it's been hard. But then the Holy Spirit would come alongside said, remember, I told you I'd never leave you or forsake you. 
And I'm always here. I'm here for that person. I'm here for you. I'm here for that family, even though they're only present through a device. I'm here for them. I'm here for those staff members. And, you know, healthcare workers sometimes get the uh, reputation that they don't care. I can tell you they care. I've seen nurses weep. I've seen doctors have to go by themselves off to a room and deal with things that they've had to deal with. I've had them to come to me and say, Chaplain, can you just listen? I can. It's been hard at times. And you, you saw those riots and you wonder, why God, why this? Why can't we just talk to one another? Why can't we know one another? Why can't we be sympathetic to struggles and offer a word of encouragement and kindness? And why in the world do our politicians have to be enemies? Why? Why can't we just reach across the barriers and, and take one another's hands and work together for this great nation and the fact that we're just people? We're just people. We're no different from anybody else. We don't wear labels on our foreheads that cause us to judge one another. We're just people just trying to do the best we can. And so in all of this we need a hope we need a hope and we find it in the word of the spirit often when we need hope most we have the least ability to read the bible so you, there are times when you you know you don't want to pick it up it's just too hard and god gives us seasons of suffering and seasons of relief and in the seasons of relief we need to dig, dig deep down in the Word of God to prepare ourselves for the seasons of suffering. You do that with, with planting. You store up seed for when it's time to plant, and uh, you, you plant that seed. It's the same thing in our spiritual walk with, with God. We need to dig deep in the Word of God when we have the opportunity and let that seed get settled deep within us so that when it comes time, when the challenge comes, it's there and ready for God to bring it to fruit. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. God produces hope, and there are six ways that he does that. That's what we're going to do for the next few minutes. Remember, first of all, that God is the God of hope. Verse 13, back to our key verse. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Everything starts with God. Everything starts with God. There's nothing that touches you that hasn't passed through the hands of God first. He's well acquainted with your life. He's well acquainted with everything that happens. He's well acquainted with every possibility that could happen. And so it all starts with God. If there is a hope for joy that will be deep and eternal and lasting through all kinds of challenges, it will be a hope that's founded on God. Anything else will fail. A hope in, a hope in even the principles of the United States of America will not see you through because as we have seen in these days that's that's not always stable Hebrews 11 6 says whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him so you know, first of all, you've got to understand, you've got to believe. If you, if you, if you want to, to draw close to God, you've got to accept, first of all, that He's there and available. 
And he's not trying to hide from you or from me or from anybody. He's not trying to, he's not trying to make it hard on purpose for us to find him. In fact, he says, if you, you, if you seek me, you will find me. And, and that's, that's the issue. Are we seeking God? Who are we seeking? What is it that we're really after? And so we have to believe that he exists as a God of hope. That's the first step. That God is a God of hope and that his hope is available to you. And it is. Whatever your circumstances today, whatever situation you are in, God is a God of hope and he's available and ready. So everything starts with God. God is the God of hope. The second step is that the God of hope speaks words of promise. There are four promises in verses 9 through 12. Now, Paul is writing to these Roman Christians. They are not Jews. They are Gentiles. They're, in other words, they are outside of the Jewish religion. But here's the big mystery, the big secret that, that, uh, had, that God has revealed through Jesus Christ, that God's desire all along was for everybody across the world to come into relationship with him, not just the Jews, and so that opportunity was open to everyone. And so that's, that's, that's one of the big motivations for Paul. He understood this finally when he was converted and was taught by the Lord himself. And he understood this finally. So he, he becomes compelled by the Holy Spirit to take this message to the nations. And that started his missionary journeys. And so he wants these Roman Christians, these, uh, these Gentiles who are outside of the Jewish religion, but who are included in the kingdom of God. He wants them to understand that. And so he, he echoes these four promises in verses 9 through 12. And he's quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting the Jewish scriptures. Now remember also, while you're thinking about all these things, nobody had one of these. Okay, nobody had a Bible back then. Okay, that came centuries later. And, uh, you know, there, if, you know the, the copies of the Jewish scripture were stored in, in synagogues, and they, were in, they weren't like this. They were in big rolls, scrolls. And not many people could read, frankly. Not Greek. Not Hebrew, not you know, not many people could read. Only the very learned, the one, the ones who were able to get that education, they were the ones who could read. And so it was very limited who had access to one of these. God has blessed us tremendously because I don't know about you, I've got more Bibles than I I'm aware of. <laughs> you know? Preachers tend to just collect them over the years, and, and, and uh, I'm sure you've got plenty. You know, and, and lo and behold, uh, you know, if I had my phone, I could show you where I could. I've got, you know, several different translations of Scripture available on my phone, you know. And even that is a fairly new, you know, I'm 69, so even that's a fairly new thing for me. Not so new for, for people about under 30, I'd say, but, but uh, it's available to us. But Paul was saying, Paul is quoting the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament here, and he says, verse 8 says that Christ became a servant so that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. And verse 9 says, as it is written, then he quotes, he quotes Psalms 1849, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Then he quotes Deuteronomy 32, 43, and verse 10, is rejoice, O Gentiles, with his, with his people. Now this is the Old Testament. Okay? These are all out of the Old Testament. They're not New Testament. This is the Old Testament. Old Covenant. Jewish Scriptures. And Paul didn't even have a concept of Old Covenant New Covenant. Well, I mean, he had Old Covenant New Covenant, but we think of it as Old Testament New Testament. Paul didn't even, those words weren't even on his mind. Because there wasn't a New Testament that we know of uh, at, at this writing. So he quotes... That uh, verse in, in Deuteronomy, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with His people. And then he quotes Psalm 117 in verse 11, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let the peoples extol Him. 
And finally, he quotes Isaiah 11.10 in verse 12. The root of Jesse will come. And even he who arises to rule the Gentiles in him will the Gentiles hope. Now, we know who the root of Jesse, the root of Jesse, of course, that's a reference to Jesus. In him will the Gentiles hope. And the remarkable thing about these four quotes, only the last one is an explicit promise. That's verse 12. The middle two quotes in verses 10 and 11 are commands or exhortations to the Gentiles. Rejoice with God's people. Praise the Lord. Extol him. And the first one in verse 9 is a testimony of a Jewish king standing in the midst of the Gentiles. So now Paul definitely sees the big picture. He's got the big picture in mind. He sees what God is up to. He understands that in Christ, all of the division between Jew and Gentile and any other division you can think of today, whatever it is, whether it's race or whether it's political affiliation or whether it's economic status or whatever it is, all of the divisions between men and women and, and uh, people and communities, all of those are broken down in Jesus. Paul sees this big picture and he wants to communicate that to these Roman Christians and to us in the year 2020, a year when we're having such a difficult time. God is going to do in history, he sees this, he's bringing the Gentiles into the covenant people, he sees hope for the Gentiles wherever God draws them to himself. And the most important thing to see here is that Paul is quoting scripture. When he is on his way to pray for the abounding hope of the church, specifically the Christians at Rome, and ultimately he precedes that prayer with God's word of promise. Don't miss that. It will be essential when we get down to step four. Paul is quoting scripture. Where's your hope? By the word and the spirit. So Paul is quoting scripture, laying a foundation for them to understand. Where is your hope today? If you haven't done it lately, and I'm sure you have, take that Bible down and spend some time with it. Start wherever you feel led. Open it. You know, Psalms is great. Because Psalms, you can find any emotion that will cross your mind and challenge your heart right there in Psalms, expressed just openly. third step is the spirit of power, the Holy Spirit, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Hope that is based on Christ and has the glory of God for its hope for treasure is not the result of human will. The hope that abounds, the hope that holds us, the hope that gives us hope isn't something we can just work up. It's not something you can, you know, maybe if you go out and buy a good pizza and eat it, it'll be, you'll feel better. No, there's, there's, there's a hope that will, that will be settled no matter what happens. Maybe it needs to be rekindled. Maybe you need to be reminded. Maybe I need to be reminded sometime. But it's there for you. If your hope is in Christ and Christ alone and not in government or a political party or good health or friends or fleeting happiness, that hope is a work of the Holy Spirit. You didn't just come up with it. By nature, our will is working against God. God understands that. He knows that. We're born in sin and we're sinful. We're, you know, that's, that's just the reality. So if the glory of God is going to become our highest hope for treasure, Listen to what I'm saying. If the glory of God is going to become our highest hoped for treasure, and if we're going to hope on the basis of Christ's righteousness and not ours, we have to be born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And that's when hope gets planted deep down within your soul. Those seeds of hope get planted in that moment. Now you've got to feed it. You've got to cultivate it. Romans 8, 6, and 7 says, The mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. For the mind of the flesh is hostile to God. In other words, the way we are by nature is hostile to God. Only the Spirit of God can change that. We don't change that by some self-help process, by just being better, thinking better, because that doesn't work. We need something that we can cling to, that, we'll, that we can go to time and time and time again, that will support us and encourage us and challenge us in our walk with Christ. So the third step in awakening hope is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of power. First, the God of hope. Second, the Word of promise. And then third, the Spirit of power. The first three steps are all objective realities different from ourselves. They're outside of us, but they're objective, they're realities, and they're not based on experience. God, the Word, and the Spirit exist whether we don't or whether we admit it or not. Okay? God and the Word and the Spirit, we, we may question it, but it's there. It's there. You can't change it. You can't affect it. And how you feel about it, how you think about it, does not change that at all. They don't depend on us. We depend on them. They are not shaped by us. We are shaped by them, by God, the Word, and the Spirit. There are three more steps, and I'll cover those quickly. The fourth step is faith. And verse 13 says, fill you with all joy and peace. How? In believing. In believing. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. The God of hope works joy and peace leading to abounding hope as we are believing. So that's where your faith comes in. So the key, key question is, how does the power of the Holy Spirit connect us to the word of promise so that it produces joy and peace and abounding hope? And the answer is that the Holy Spirit does it by creating faith. Did you know that your faith is not something that you came up with? My faith is not something that I came up with. My faith is something that God gave to me as I made that first step to trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The Holy Spirit planted and grew faith in me. Faith is a gift. And as I, I have shared with many, many patients in the hospital, you know, Pastor, I'm just not sure, I'm just not sure that I have enough faith. And I, I would say to that person, and I say to you today, it's not the size of your faith it is the size of your God in whom you have faith. If your God is too weak and too small to handle your circumstances, then your faith isn't going to work. But if your God is able, and if your God is strong, and if your God is not surprised by any circumstance that you face, but is well aware of what you're facing, what you're dealing with. If your God is, is able to handle anything at all, then your faith, no matter what size your faith is, your faith is deep and strong and able. Jesus said it like this. He said, if you have the, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. So it's not the size of your faith, it's the size of your God in whom you have faith. Picture it this way, before we're converted or we're born again, we have a spiritually dead heart. And then by God's grace, in some way, our spiritually dead heart is presented with the word of promise, the gospel of Christ. Well, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes and gives new birth, new life, new spiritual perception to our new heart. And suddenly we see Christ in the word of promise for who he really is. 
And when our born-again heart sees Christ for who He really is, faith receives Him, embraces Him, unites with Him. And this link, this connection with Christ in the Word of Promise is the channel, the connection through which the joy-giving, peace-giving, hope-giving power of the promises flow to us. And we see that crucial connection between step two and step four. Saving, hope-giving faith is never a vague, positive attitude in the Bible. Okay? Nothing wrong with having a positive attitude. You ought to have one. But faith is a lot more than a positive attitude. It's very focused in God's blood-bought words of promise. It is what happens when you read verse 12, and the Holy Spirit awakens a sense of the truth and beauty and reality and value of what God says. The root of Jesse will come. Yes, praise God, our king has come. The real king, not just the person who lives in the White House. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, the king has come, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. Yes, my king rules over all the nations, not just the United States of America. In him will the Gentiles hope. Yes, I will hope in him. He is my Savior and my Lord and my God. No matter what happens next week, what am I saying? Should, should we not care? No, we should care. We need to care. We need to pray, just like we did this morning. And I hope we continue to pray individually tonight and tomorrow and all through Tuesday and Tuesday night. And who knows when we'll know the results of this election. Whenever that is, keep praying. Because whoever is elected doesn't bypass this election process, my friends, doesn't bypass God at all. God is very much involved in all of this. And so all of this, all of this that, that I just talked about, that's the work of the Holy Spirit as He awakens faith in the Word of Promise. Step five is awakening in our hearts joy and peace. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing I already mentioned that above. It's a joy not in things or money or celebrities or politics or even good health. It's a joy in the Lord. I've talked to people in the hospital that are facing their end of life and I go into their room and I and I, I introduce myself. Hi, my name's Mary and I'm chaplain for Beaufort Memorial. And I just want to tell you I prayed for you this morning. And that person is facing the greatest challenge of their life on this earth and they'll look at me with a smile on their face and they'll say chaplain I'm so happy to meet you I'm so glad that you're here but you know what whatever God has for me is fine I don't know what's coming or when it's coming but I'm ready for whatever it may be thank you for praying for me And sometimes they will bless me with a prayer and send me on my way to visit some other patient. I tell you, that's a blessed experience. That's a holy place. And that finally leads us to number six, abounding in hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. This is, a, this is a surprise because surely hope is what prompted joy and peace. Surely when we saw the word of promise coming from the God of hope, it gave us hope and hope in turn prompts that joy and peace. But now Paul ends by saying that joy and peace result in abounding hope. God fills you with joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope. Hard to have hope when there's no joy, when there's no peace. But we have the joy 
we have the peace in Christ through the Word, through the Spirit, so that we can abound in hope. So the point is this. The fullness of hope never reaches a limit in this life. It can always grow and always abound more and more. And Paul is pointing out that one of the ways it grows is that it's feeding off of its own fruit. Hope is the promises. Hope in the promises of God produces the fruit of joy and peace. But joy and peace in the promises of God are glorious evidences that we're born again. And every evidence that we're born again stirs up even more hope. You can go back to Romans 5 for that. It stirs up more hope and more hope wakens more joy and peace so the graces of God continues to abound more and more and more and more. It's kind of like it starts and it just keeps going if you let it. And you don't get distracted and you don't get discouraged. And if you do get distracted and discouraged, what do you do? You go back to the Word of God and you read Romans 15, 13, one more time. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Let's pray.